The agenda this week considered obstacles to getting big things built in Ontario, explored whether laneway houses can help with a housing crunch, and heard why Mississauga Mayor Bonnie Crombie may be off to Queen's Park. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with a reaction to last night's debate among candidates for mayor of Toronto. Okay, you've been through this before, so naturally I want to start with you. You've been on a debate stage. You know what they've been through. How'd they do? I actually think they did really well. And the first thing I'll say is that... Um, it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> it's really tough to be up there, and I think all of them did extremely well. Uh, there's, I think there's some highlights, definitely. The trick in a debate is getting people off their talking notes. You know, I heard a lot tonight that you can read on a website, you've seen it tweeted before, you've heard it in a conversation before, and that's not really the interesting parts. So I think the the moments, you know, the repetitive bits, you know, Mitzi Hunter was pretty repetitive. She's costed a budget. Uh, there was the repetitive bits, the jabs at Chow about about raising taxes. That wasn't really the interesting part. It's not informative. It doesn't actually really enable people to weigh the options and the character of these different candidates. And I think when they really got into the meat of it, you started to see some of the personalities on stage, which gives you a sense of how they really work together, as opposed to actually just you know hearing hearsay about how they work together or the, those, the talking notes that they have. So I would say, overall, I think there's some pretty good tidbits for us to extract from that debate. I think we have six extremely capable candidates. Whether or not they have a great track record or not is something we should litigate in the next hour. <laughs> but I think that, you know, that was a, you know, I'm comparing it to what I watch on American television. And that was a pretty damn good conversation that just took place. Sabine, your view. Yeah, it, you know, I, I used to do debate coach prep for candidates of all sorts. and. And what you try and do is you get them ready to do a series of almost like 30 second commercials or 60 second commercials because one way of playing for a debate is, uh, is uh, risk mitigation. You know, you get your key messages out, you don't get pushed off. Uh, what's really fun is when you actually see them, a bit of spark, a bit of a sense of humor uh, because, you know, the, the role of the mayor, it, it isn't like the role of the premier or anybody in a Westminster system. It really is, you know, a horseshoe uh, with, uh, you know, the strong mayor powers notwithstanding. It's a place where people have to work together. And so I think it's right. Like, it, it, they managed, uh, they managed to, to disagree without being disagreeable to a very large measure. You know, a few sparks here and there. But I, I thought it was, it was pretty good. And it was also pretty good to see a group of people who actually looked kind of like what you'd see if you got on a TTC subway car. Like, it, it was, you know, diversity, yay. You know, <laughs> it, and it, it, it should be taken for granted. But you can't take it for granted. So that was nice. Sabrina. I agree. It was wonderful to see some of the personalities come out and even some of the bickering back and forth. Because when voters look at who they're going to elect, they look at two things. Yes, there's the policies and the platforms, and do you agree with those? But beyond that, is this politician, is this candidate lying to me? What are they going to do when there are challenges or unexpected crises? Like, what is their character? And here we actually got to see a glimpse of that, I think perhaps really for the first time. And we got to see the candidates beyond, again, what's just on their websites. And I know I walked away feeling like I knew them better and who I would trust more to follow through on some of these critical issues that were raised. And I'm sure a lot of viewers felt the same. Alicia. This feels kind of like being on a hockey panel, like analyzing what just happened. But um, <laughs> I've watched maybe four or five debates so far. So you are hearing the same things repeated over and over. And maybe some of the stories kind of lose their passion when you're hearing them, you know, friends in basements, um, all, of, all of those things. But I think people who aren't following it very closely are not really looking for the sort of streams of policy things that maybe you only understand if you're like following housing very closely. Um, they're looking to connect with people, like Sabrina talked about trust. They're looking to see who represents them. We've heard, I think, most powerfully, the personal stories of the candidates, I think, come across really well in these debates. We have people who immigrated here. We have people who um, grew up in low-income families, people who have different experiences that represent the, pe the people of Toronto in a way that we don't often see on these stages. And I think that is what's really coming across in these kinds of debates. 
Sabrina, I want to follow up on something you just said, because you said character emerges when you see a good interchange of ideas like this. Build on that, if you would, a little bit. What, what character emerged here that connected with you? I think you see someone has some fight in them, that passion, if they really care about the issue beyond the talking points. And I think when you saw some of those battles between Josh or Brad or Mark, you really saw, even if you agree or disagree with their respective policies, that they're really in it, they believe it, they're standing behind they're standing behind what they're talking about. Whereas I felt with some of the others, other personal anecdotes, like Olivia seemed to have one for everything. And, you know, she's gesturing wildly, but the conviction for me just wasn't there. It rang hollow. Uh, she says she understands people, but does she really when you talk about engagement with voters? She's been in politics a long time. If she was that good at engaging people, she would have been elected by now. Uh, so I think that was what I took away from it. Shoshana to you first. What does this saga of trying to build this light rail transit line 100 meters north of where we're sitting right now, what does this tell us about our ability to build big, thing, big things these days? I think it tells us that we're wishing that it could be cheap and easy and free. And so we're searching for a magic formula that will make hard, expensive things easy to build. And that there isn't a magic formula. Hard big things are hard big things, and we're going to have to build them, and we should be realistic about this. Part of the challenge with Eglinton is that it was the first PPP structure for a transit line in the city. Public-private partnership. Public-private partnership, thank you. And we didn't have very much experience with that. We took how we usually did things, run by the TTC, and we decided to do it in a totally new way because we thought it would be better, cheaper, faster. And actually doing things in new and different ways can be harder, slower learning experience. And when we give over a very important public works project to the private sector, we lose some of the control over what happens to it. The 407 was a hard big thing, took less time than the Eglinton LRT. Maple Leaf Gardens was a hard big thing, took less time than the Eglinton LRT. Why can't we do these things anymore? Well, Maple Leaf Gardens was a building. We actually build buildings better than we do linear infrastructure. Highways we have more experience on than actually transit. We stopped building transit. You know, the or I looked up line one and line two. They each took about five years to build, decades to plan, because the politics of it slowed it down. Mm -hmm. So those two took time in a city that was not nearly developed. What we this found was the, the, the young the young, the and the young blue line, line, the young line, seventy and years the ago. Blue line. Yeah, exactly. Each took about five years to build line one and line two. So it's always taken us time to build that. But Shoshana's is right that you know across Eglinton, in a city that is substantially built, we ran into a bunch of unknown unknowns. Right? Um, you <laughs> thank, know, you and, and, uh, thank you, Donald Rumsfeld. Thank you, Donald Rumsfeld. And uh, and we stopped building. Transit, now we're trying to catch up, and it's not easy. Joe, can you explain it? I think the other honest reason is there were too many people uh, involved in the construction. So if you, if you look at who's involved in Eglinton, uh, you have the province through Infrastructure Ontario, uh, and then through Metrolinx, uh, and then you have the city uh, involved through the TTC. Uh, and I suspect that's one too many people at the party. The, the, the trick on successful uh, implementation of big projects seems to be to have your financer, your builder, and your client operator all part of the construction management team. Uh, it, it's, it's not quite clear to me, honestly, what the, the TTC sort of seemed to be half in and half out on, on, on this one. And um, so that, that always sets up friction, uh, and it always sets up uh, 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 authority without responsibility at the end of a project, which is the worst time uh, for people to do that. Um, so I think there was some real confusion in the structural management of that project. And this is, again, not atypical. Uh, the successful projects, and we can talk about that uh, in a while, are, I think, uh, governments and cities who have managed to organize who's in charge, what are we doing, who's going to run it, who's going to pay for it, get that sorted early, uh, and then construction uh, can can uh, can proceed more more easily. But even then, you're going to run into trouble because of the unknown unknowns. Right? I want to get Drew on this for a second because that that is. Uh, I want to find out if there are too many chefs in the kitchen here because Infrastructure Ontario, Metrolinx, Toronto Transit Commission. Let's not forget about the Ministry of Transportation. 
the minister is uh, allegedly overseeing this Ministry whole thing. of Infrastructure. Ministry of Infrastructure. Uh, the, the consortium of four companies that is actually building this thing. The They're, city. City of Toronto. Okay. Are there too and, many cooks in the kitchen? And the feds. The, the feds, feds are largely a funder. They're a silent partner on this project. They will increasingly not become a silent partner because they have a much bigger budget to spend on infrastructure and they expect to have a bigger say. So we have a very complicated governance, both horizontally in terms of many players within each order of government and vertically among the orders of government. That theoretically should lead to better decisions. It often leads actually to worse. And the other challenge is, if we compare ourselves to other countries, Australia, New Zealand, who are facing the same challenge with regard to building out infrastructure after decades of not doing it, the balance between good politics and good policy is different. The focus on good policy is stronger. It doesn't mean that at the end of the day the politicians don't make the final decision, but there's an expectation that they defer to experts. And if at the end of the day they decide that they want to take their own advice and go with a project that may not fit the parameters in terms of cost-benefit analysis of the experts, they have to face public studies that sh say otherwise. Here, actually, the process is a little too private and the balance isn't quite right. In your experience, do people who own homes want to be in a position of being sort of mom and pop real estate developers slash landlords? What I've seen is there's sort of two categories. There's the homeowner type, which I think is what you're describing, where the, you know, they live in the principal residence and they rent out the second or the third unit. There's also the property owner type, which is they don't reside there, but they rent out the entire unit. So there's sort of two categories. In Kingston, primarily, the majority of the take up has been on the property owners, so full rentals, as opposed to homeowners. But to some of the points that uh, the other panelists have made about for homeowners right now where buying a home is perhaps getting a little bit far reaching. This helps offset the mortgage mm -hmm. and the payments associated with that and it also provides more rental units on the market. So which, people are game to do it. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Christine, um, I want to circle back to something you said earlier. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the moment, you, you, if you're putting a garden suite in your backyard or something like that, uh, you can't sever that and sell that, can you? to somebody else. You're just no. a tenant at that point. Not right? in Toronto, not at the not moment. Not in Toronto, right. No. Should not it be that way? I think it should. Um, I look at uh, London, England has Muse housing, which was old carriage houses behind the main house that are all mainly independent properties now and very, very affluent neighborhoods sort of within the main neighborhoods. Um, so I, I think they should be severed, uh, ultimately, if that's what people desire. But I think we need to see those laneway houses or those laneways becoming their own kind of streets mm. in a way. And um, as Greg had mentioned, you know, cycling down the laneways, you start to see people living and occupying and um, making their mark on those spaces. We'll see that more and more and it will become the next natural step. Any thought to that, Greg, allowing severance and purchase of those smaller suites on the edges of the property? Yeah, you know, first things first, we need rental housing in this city. Uh, more than anything else, we need uh, that flexible housing stock. We're not building enough rental housing for all kinds of other reasons It would probably take another panel to cover. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the provincial direction is certainly accessory dwelling units on the same lot, uh, tethered to the main house for, for water and, and, and hydro. Um, and that's the principal opportunity here is, I think, to expand housing options through that means. Uh, there could be the odd, the odd one that, you know, makes sense to sever. But the whole thrust of the, of the policy direction has been uh, rental housing and, and associating it with, with the, main, the main dwelling. Gotcha. Can you take us back to 1998? This was amalgamation year, I guess, right. for Kingston. What did you do in that city to kind of make all of this easier to have happen? Oh, well, um, I don't know if it exactly happened in 1998. Um, we actually just passed our consolidated zoning bylaw last year. You're it took, kidding. It took us 20 years. Wow. <laughs> Why? Uh, it's just one of those projects that got pushed <laughs> off and off and didn't get done. But I'm very thankful we have one zoning bylaw now, not five. 
So one zoning bylaw instead of five allowed yeah. you to happen, but it took 20 years for that one zoning bylaw to be approved. It did. That's an, another story unto itself, absolutely. <laughs> we're, 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 I, I, we've got lots of show ideas here for yeah. future shows, apparently. Uh, okay, do we have that problem when we went mega city in Toronto in 1997? We, we uh, I would say, the, the ability to have this dates back to, I think, 2003. If, and I'm nodding at my planning, uh, my planning friend here. But uh, the city did not really get its act together until much more recently with, with laneway suites. Uh, we've, had, we've had permission for secondary suites, you know, house a, a, a unit in the basement for quite a number of years. But we had certain tests associated with that. So I would say a lot of hesitancy about this. And something happened, and I think it was the housing crisis, the housing challenge, the mm -hmm. fact, frankly, that more people were feeling the affordability pinch than they had previously. Um, and, and not that a lot of people haven't been feeling that affordability pinch for a long, long time. They have. But old so habits die hard. Old habits die hard. And I think this evolution has picked up speed and people's values are changing, changing about it. The norms are changing about it. The, the way that people talk about housing today, um, it, that, that wasn't in the conversation the way it was maybe 15 years ago. And it's probably next to parking, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the number one issue. Thing. Let, let's go back to Sudbury. Uh, Angel, how about in, in Sudbury? Do, what is the sense at City Hall as to whether or not uh, the city mothers and fathers have truly embraced these new and different ideas in terms of dealing with the housing crunch? I think Sudbury is definitely uh, embracing some of these new ideas. I know even kind of the tiny homes concept is, is becoming a little bit of a popular um, idea throughout the um, city and in, in the uh, in the zoning bylaws. Uh, they're, they're looking how, at how tiny is a tiny can, home, incidentally. Uh, I think roughly around 400 to 500 square feet. That's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> so and the idea, the concept of that is really to. Uh, there, it's kind of this co-housing uh, type of uh, format where uh, you may have kind of a commute, the, the primary residence is sort of like has its communal um, kitchen and laundry and stuff like that. And then your tiny home is uh, really for kind of your sleeping, uh, you have a study area, washroom, uh, but it can get larger than that. So uh, some some interesting concepts would be to essentially, you know, could you could you have a tiny home that's on a larger uh, lot and sever that lot and and you start integrating that into the uh, neighborhood fabric. Why would you want this job? Well, look, um, I'm interested in bringing the province back to the center. The current administration, um, I have some issues with their approach and the way they do business, and they're far too far to the right, the opposition too far to the left. I'm a centrist, I'm fiscally responsible, but yet I'm the uh, very socially progressive. So I'd like to see more transparency, more accountability, um, and tighter fiscal management all at the same time. I will tell you what the turning point was for me, if that interests mm -hmm. you. I've met people in Hamilton, I've met people in Ottawa. In Ottawa, I had a young woman come up to me and she said, you're my mayor. I trust you. I have confidence in your leadership skills. I like your management style. You're a strong fiscal manager. And I agree with your, uh, your decisions and have confidence in them. I don't want you going anywhere. And I said, you know what? I really appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. I said, what if I took that same management style, that same fiscal responsible approach that you define, and what if I applied that to towns and municipalities right across the province and to the province's finance in general? Do you think we all could be better off? That same transparent, accountable approach that you have credited me for, which I am very accountable and very transparent. What'd Would say? we be better off? And she said, a light went off, I could see it. She goes, you've got me. You're right, please proceed. Okay. I, I... The reason I ask the question is you are arguably vying for, or ultimately potentially vying for, the worst job in politics today. Why? Because the Ontario Liberals are, you know, according to so many people in this province, a spent force. You've come third, no, you're not you yet, but the Ontario Liberals have come third two elections in a row. That's never happened in 156 years. 
The current Prime Minister's lack of popularity at the moment, you'll excuse me for saying, is an albatross around the neck of the Ontario Liberal Party. The NDP have a pretty new leader who is yeah, she's young and dynamic and respected and mm -hmm. could make an alternative case uh, to Doug Ford if and when that time comes. So how would you convince us that this job that you are vying for is worth more than a bucket of spit? <laughs> well, look what happened federally. They went from, uh, Justin Trudeau took them from fifth place party to majority government. I think that can be, uh, that can be repeated. I think they were only in third, weren't they? Oh, I think they were in fifth. Really? I got to <laughs> well, look Well, you can that. look back and check. Uh, you're we'll the, check it out. You're no, the that's true. They went, you know, they I went think, from well back to, to majority uh, Correct. Government. I think it needs someone to, to ignite the brand and to reinvigorate the brand and have those policy discussions at the local level. And it takes someone of profile and preeminence. And I think that I have worked hard and built a certain profile and, and, and certain reputation. And I think I could be that person. Now, if we get into this race and we have great discussion and debate and other, other individuals, other candidates are willing to put forward the centrist views as I am, because I believe in governing from center or slightly right of the center, if we can come together, maybe I'll have done my work. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.